Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Good to see you today. Welcome, hey. Mr. Vanya. Wow. Appreciate you showing up. Wow. David From Skoll. way up high in the mountains. L.J. Stewart. Yeah. Very nice turnout here. Mark Hennon from New York. Great to see you here. Wow. I, want to, I, want, I want to know what's going on with your... Your apartment there in New York, the saga of that amazing loft apartment that you had, and if you still get to live there, tell me in the chat what's going on with that. Um, quick, 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 quick story about Mark Hennon. I don't know how many anybody knows Mark Hennon, but he's out there in New York City. I think it's Tribeca or something. Back in, I don't know, probably the 80s or 90s, he scored an amazing loft apartment in what was an industrial building. It's huge. Um, And, you know, he could work on pianos there, do all this cool stuff. It was super inexpensive. I think it was rent controlled in some way. And basically he had stuck it out there for so many years until he's pretty much the last, you know, rent controlled in this building where they really wanted him out of there. (laughs) so that they could actually start charging again and um but he really got a lot of this very beautiful uh loft apartment that he created there and also kind of a rebuilding studio okay so let's talk about our guest today here um uh, we'll yes. a little introduction to the show for those of you newbies who need to know what we're doing here um so this is piano tech radio hour and what we do is we bring you the most interesting and knowledgeable folks from the piano industry to have some cool chats with them. Uh, This event is brought to you by uh, Piano Technicians Masterclasses, which is an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. The new news is that we're having a convention again in March on the 18th to the 20th. And we had a great convention experience back in December. It was the very first ever online piano tech convention. Really happy with how how it went. So we decided to do another one. And our guest today will be present. And we're very excited about that. He's a revered instructor. And I will give a little bit more about him and then we'll get started. Uh, Oh, and and by the way, if you do want to attend that convention, I don't know if you noticed, for those of you that didn't, you've got like a day or something to catch it. I put a coupon code in a recent email where you can get 50% off the final cost of the convention, not the current cost, but the final cost, which is less than what the listed prices are right now. So if you want to seek out that coupon code, or I'll, actually I'll just tell it to you right now, it's all caps, enjoy 50, the number 50 and the word enjoy, no spaces. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so if you're excited to get the best price you can, go ahead and use that in the next couple of days. About Fred Sturm, who is our guest today. Uh, His training has included the full four weeks of the CF Theodore Steinway Academy, one week of training with Shigeru Kawai, two weeks at the Sauter factory in Spikingen, Germany, um, 10 or more national PTG conventions and various other opportunities. As a pianist, Fred has specialized in the music of Latin America and of Brazilian composer, Hector Villalobos. In particular, We talked about the pronunciation before. I hope I got that right. Um, For over 25 years, he's been been doing this type of music. And Fred performs regularly now and has recorded and released five CDs with another in process. So Fred, wow, really great to have you here. Impressive background. And uh, welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. Glad to be here. Um, Hello to everybody in these days of, um, of what shall we say, socially distanced um, um, <laughs> yeah. communication. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, one of the things that we had um, talked about is the, um, 
connection between being careers of careers of being a pianist and a piano technician. And oh, yeah. I'd, I'd like to just yeah. say a few words about that as an opening. Um, you, you know, there hey, are... Fred, before, I, but before you start, let me say <clears throat> to everybody else that's here, very grateful to have you. I believe I suggested you as a guest. Um, I've been here for about 15 years. I've been in classes. I've heard at least two CDs. We have a massive opportunity today to get to ask questions of a of a human being that's a high end concert and recording quality piano technician and a high end world class pianist at the same time. Very rare. Very rare. So I have burning questions for him about aftertouch and about how that's used in in his uh, in his uh, playing protocol. So I'm sure that there's other of you nerds that have questions that come up about the interface, as he just was going to hove into of technician and pianist. So. This is just focus, ask great questions, and pay attention, kids. Mr. Stern. Yeah, uh, one of the interesting aspects of the two careers, as it were, is that really, uh, in both cases, being a piano technician and trying to be as good a piano technician as you can, and being a, a musician, being a pianist, um, both are, uh, are endlessly impossible careers to encompass entirely. And both require tremendous drive, um, inner development, provide the opportunity to use areas of your brain and your body that are not used by the typical person. Um, they both require a certain amount of obsessive compulsive, um, I won't call it disorder, I'll just call it focus. Because, because yeah, you, you don't really want to have the disorder, you want to, to be using the obsession and the compulsion toward an end. Um, and of course, in the final analysis, the pianist and the piano technician are a team that makes possible the magic of bringing the, um, the ideas, the imaginations of composers to life. Um, you, you know, I, uh, I became a piano technician as a day job. Um, I, what I really wanted to do was play the piano, but I couldn't see a way to play the piano and make a living at it that I would want to do. Um, so that's, you know, that's how I got into the game. Um, once I became a technician at a university, I had the opportunity to experiment with all kinds of things, uh, learn, all, well, to take all of the things that I could read about in books, in the journal, uh, that learn about in classes at conventions and so forth, and put them into practice without, some, without having to sell the job. Um, I could simply learn how to, well, come up with my own way of putting those things into practice and observe those instruments over a long period of time and play on, on the instruments. Wow. So it was kind of like, it was kind of like your own personal long-term competency playground. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And 
and one the one career informed the other. Um, that is, as I was able to prep the pianos in in, in, in increasing uh, levels of, of refinement, I was able to develop my technique in ways that I had never been able to before, because oh, I had yeah. never I had never had well prepped pianos available to me to practice on, and rarely to perform on. Huge that statement. That huge is. statement to make. Hmm? That's a huge statement to make that. In your life previously, you had had very few or almost no really well pre prepped pianos as a player. You know, as and, a player. And I think that's common. You know, it's common, especially outside of the major metropolitan areas. Um, the thing is that we. And, th and this is one of the things that has really motivated me um, to continually improve my craft and to develop protocols for piano preparation and try to diffuse them one way or another, writing articles, uh, giving classes, whatever, uh, writing on the caught list, uh, so forth, is because we we have a responsibility and it's a heavy responsibility. Pianists depend on us absolutely and they don't know what to ask for. So if we don't know how to give pianos, pianists what they need, they're never gonna have it and they're going to be handicapped. Um, just mention one little anecdote, um, probably about 20 years ago, I, my, my former piano teacher in, in, as an undergrad was retiring and had someone gave her some money to, um, to do with as she wished for a, a, a retirement party. And she decided to have a, a, a concert and invite some of her former students. And I was one of them. So I went and I spent some time with her in her house and um, you know, she's asking me, what are you working on these days? And I want to go over to the piano and show her. And, oh my God, I simply, could, you know, it brought me back to the days when I was studying with her. This piano, you can't do these things on. The effects that I have sweated blood over, it, you know, it can't happen. Um, and you can because... only create these effects right. when you have an instrument that is uh, where, where everything is prepped, where you have even, I mean, it has to be at least some kind of consistent level. We don't absolutely have to have all let off at one millimeter, but you have to have it at least within two millimeters and, and so forth. I mean, you know, down the line, um, so the, the going to all of these, you know, going to, to the New York things and, uh, and so forth, the Schweikingen Germany was the real eye opener for me because those guys in, in that factory, you know, it's interesting. I went there, the uh, Klavier Baumeister asks me, what do you want to learn while you're here? And I said, I want to learn how to prep grand pianos. And he said, well, the one guy who I would have you have train you uh, is off on sick leave and won't be back. And that leaves it on me and I have a lot of stuff to do. Well, we'll do what we can. Because what they do is they make a thousand uprights a year and a hundred grands a year, opposite of Steinway, right? Uh, so we did that, but while I was there, for I, I worked on grands for a week, and while I was there, I seen what those upright guys were doing. It's just completely eye-opening to me. You play on those upright pianos, and they're wonderful. What is wonderful about them? And the answer is 
the care to detail that goes into their preparation. It's not something magic in the soundboard wood. I'm not saying, I mean, the soundboard wood is important. The ribbing is important. The scaling is important. The hammers are important, but it's really the detailed work that they do on every single instrument, every right. single upright piano there, every hammer is voiced more, more than the entire, all of the hammers in any upright made in America ever. Well, not ever. They, they used to voice back in the 20s. I don't think anyone voiced an upright hammer in any factory in America, well, there may be there may be an exception or two, in the fifties, through the through the end of the twentieth century, they just didn't do it. Uh, let alone travel, let alone all of these other things. So yeah, I, it's, I take it's, those techniques and I go back to the university, and I go and work on my fifty-year-old Hamilton Studios. And I find that, hey, wow, these could be quite acceptable instruments. You can make music on them. Where I previously had thought that they're, they're trash, right? Um, and and, and the, you thought they were trash because they were so deeply out of regulation and needed to be rebushed and just... Well, yeah, you know, until you have... Let's let's just talk about travel. You know, hammers going this way and that way, and oh my god! Uh, and I never would have gone to the trouble because it's so much trouble on a piano like that to, you know, to pull the whole thing to get the spring out of the way, all of that work, put it back in. Uh, you know, it just uh, it never would have occurred to me to do a fine travel job because it's so time consuming. Well, you learn how. You train yourself, you figure out how to do it as efficiently as you can, and you do it. And then you square the hammers, the cast the hammers, however you want it. I like to call it squaring up um, because what we're really doing is we're balancing the hammer on the shank so that it is, uh, so that the center of it is in the arc that goes directly to the string. And you pile them and you needle all of the shoulder, do deep needling on all of the shoulders and you do a, a nice even regulation. And no, that's a piano. Yes, wow. piano starts to sing. So there's, there's two things that I wanna to say to kind of like support everything you're saying. One is what I say at the beginning of pretty much every class I've ever taught. Pianos are insanely technician dependent. You know, they just, yep. that's just, that's just the state of being of an acoustic piano. Uh, number one. Number two, the percentage of people that have the passion and the commitment to go all the way to like a, a, achieving or certainly on the road to achieving mastery with their body and their ears and their, their sensibilities to learn how to make a piano sing. That's what Fred was learning from his mentors. And then you can't just learn from your mentors. You gotta go do it then. The second phrase is, you got to like being in the trenches. And the trenches are traveling nasty old upright hammers. The trenches are doing 88 things, you know, what, seven, eight, nine, ten times. That's, that's what it takes to make a piano sing and sustain and bloom on the other end. And that's why Fred. You know, one, of, and one, one of the real problems that we all face as piano technicians is having the opportunity. Because um, if all you are doing is home service, 
and you're taking, you know, you're taking appointments and uh, doing four piano tunings a day, five days a week or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you see a piano that needs something. Now you're going to have to sell the job. You're going to have to know how many hours it's going to take to be able to come up with some kind of a budget. You have to be secure that the result will be worth the money that you're trying to sell. Now, how did you get those chops to be able to do that? And the only way you get those chops is by doing it, which is why the university job was absolutely the most wonderful thing I ever did all as, at the same time as being the stupidest thing I ever did because, you know, I could have made 10 times as much money over the last 20 years. Yeah. Um, but being at a university, I had the opportunity to just make that decision. It needs hammers. I'll order some hammers. I've got a budget. Um, put them uh, on, try this kind of hammer, try that kind of hammer. Um, needs voicing. Well, how do you voice? Experiment with this, this method, that method, the other method, and finally uh, find out what works. Um, and, and by the way, what works, and the only thing that really works is deep shoulder needling. Um, very deep. Not five millimeter, 10 millimeter. 11, 12 millimeters sometimes. Exactly. All the way down in. 10, 10 millimeter minimum. Yeah. Um, at, you yeah. know, when I first right. saw voicing tools like that, I said, no way. I hang on a second. I've got someone I need to. Yeah. Back. All right. Um, I'll take a. Sorry, I'm, I'm back. <laughs> that was hilarious, dude. Teaches piano lessons, and 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 she has a a parent who is Chinese and speaks only Chinese, and he came to this door. So, ah. Um, so where where was I? Life as we know it. Awesome. <laughs> we have to continue living our lives. Um, lost my thread. Can you remind me? Uh, well, I'll bring a question in from the chat okay. actually real That's quick fine. here um, or a comment and see what it says. And we can return to this if we want to. Um, Diane said, after finishing one grad, the owner sat down and played. Suddenly she stopped, sighed in relief and asked me, do you know what it is like to concertize? Uh, it's like riding in a rodeo. You have to ride whatever bucking bronco they send you out on. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely true. Absolutely. I, and, and it I, is I, I use a I use a different metaphor. I say, say you're, you know, say you're a gigolo for hire, and you come through the hotel room door, and you see some troll-looking creature. You don't know if it's male or female, but you got to make love to that. <laughs> you got you got to you know act like you're cool with that. Whatever you run across. You know, same thing. The only instrumentalists that don't carry their little baby in with them, right? Except for timpani drummers and stuff, right? Uh, well, I have a cousin who plays bass, and if he goes traveling, <laughs> he doesn't take his bass. Ooh, he, it, it's hard to take a bass. You uh, take a cello, you can buy a seat for it. A bass. You, you know, there are it's big, it's anyway. big cargo, big <laughs> cargo. Yeah, it is. Uh, but, it, you know, um, I guess I was talking about the the voicing thing and, yeah. the, and the deep, but uh, but that was yeah, somebody somebody point. reminded us in the chat too. He said, What tool were you going to talk about before the interruption? He was oh, something oh, about you, I, you're talking I, about I, deep I, needling I, and I. I it's it's over over the years. I'd see these pictures of the <laughs> and I'd see these insanely long needles. Insane to me because all of the needling I had done uh, 
they would break off the first time, you know? Uh, so th this is stupid, I thought. This is unrealistic. No, it isn't. It is what professional voicers have used all along. And the trick, if you like, is that you don't jab, you press. Right. You start with the tip of the needles at the surface of the hammer and you push in. Uh, and ergonomically, this works a whole lot better if you're standing up and using your body weight, as opposed to trying to use these crazy forearm um, uh, muscles uh, with your stack sitting on your knees. As uh, uh, Not to say that you need to be able to do stack on your knees kind of needling as well, but if you're going to do a whole set, you're best off to be standing there over it. Um, and until you have done that kind of, of needling on a set of hammers, you won't have developed its full tonal gradient um, potential. The, the whole trick, well, the, what we really want out of voicing is the ability to have a wide range, the widest possible range of color in, uh, in the whole piano available on every single note so that every single note with a very small difference of speed, pressure, depression can stand out above every other note. And also at the same time, you can put any note below any other note. That is to say, you, you're, we're, we're trying to have minute differences in, in our technique of speed, force, et cetera, and be able to bring out one note above another. How does that happen? It happens because they have different timbres, because it has more high end. It's the high end that stands out. It's also the right. reason why the very top of the piano has to be bright like glass. Why? It's not to, it doesn't, it's not there to sound pretty. It's there to stand out over the other notes that you're playing. Oh. And you, you know, if you're creating, trying to create a wash of color um, and have a melody stick out over the top of it. The melody can be anywhere. It can be in the middle of the piano, it can be down below, it can be way up high. In any case, you have to be able to make any note that you want to stand out above all of this other stuff you're doing. Um, it needs to be able to sing. It sings by ringing and by having high partials is what it boils down to. Now, if you do, this kind of deep shoulder needling where you're opening up the sides and then kind of coming off at the very top of the crown so that you maintain this kind of a diamond shape and a diamond hardness. That will give you the, that possibility. That's the model. Um, forget about all of the tricks uh, I, not to say that you don't use them once in a while, but, but there really isn't any mystery. This is what works. And in fact, it, in my experience, it works on lacquered Steinway hammers. That's what I do when I am, you know, you got, have to have enough lacquer to, to, because you didn't have enough density of felt over the crown to start with, so you have to lacquer to get that. And then you do this same, uh, as, as long as you haven't saturated it so much, you can't get the needles in. I mean, don't do that. Or if you've done it, wash it out. Um, but that's what gives you this ability to have a, um, a tonal gradient. 
I got a couple of questions coming in in the chat. I think people are curious about specificity on the kind of tools that you're using when you're voicing, asking if you're using a chopstick tool, um, maybe specifically for some of the things that you recommended, like the techniques is the deep needling, what kind of needle are you using, um, single needle chopstick voicing tool, any uh S single Thoughts needle that? I only really use for for touch up of the attack sound um, of being able to you know if I'm trying to play pianissimo and there's some note called bonk you know da, 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 bum, 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 uh, that's that's where I use it um, I I mostly use a three needle tool. I mostly use, well, I I, I use a tool that I got from Jurgen um, Pianoforte Supply, his three needle tool with his number seven needles. Number seven by from his supplier is virtually identical in, in diameter to number six, John James, which is another supplier. Don't bother about the number, mic it, and find out what works for you. I usually use that, uh, typically, and, and um, yeah, typically 11 millimeters, as, as Dave Anderson said, um, occasionally a little more. And, oh, and of course, going up the scale, once you get into the top couple octaves, obviously less, you'd be going through the wood. Um, and, and as long as you're talking about what you use to needle, I also, for purposes of needling the, um, of creating una corda sound, una corda difference, um, I use smaller needles, um, then uh, I, I use quilting needles. They come up to about a number 12. Uh, so I generally use 10 to 12. You can find quilting needles online uh, and, and only sticking out about three millimeters max. Um, and I use them in a five needle tool that I get from Jurgen. Um, so we're talking about needling between the grooves here for Una Corda. Um, and it's a matter of uh, doing a, a good vertical deep needle and maybe, maybe at both one o'clock, 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock at the point where it stops to have the maximum amount of change there and then kind of in between the string groove and that point I'll go at an angle maybe just once I mean it, you, you have to experiment and find out what's going to work so what you have now is the densest felt the, the, um, the maximum attack noise where the groove is and there's a half position that is an angle and then there is a full position that has more um, uh, more strokes so it's been softened up more and deeper and you can do this kind of to a whole instrument in a half an hour then you can also use this same kind of technique. And at this point, I'm going down to the 12 needle, number 12 needle. And by the way, we're not going like this with those needles, they'll break off. You have to go straight in and straight back out. Um, for, um, for touch up, you know, it's, it's starting to get a little brittle sounding you can use this kind of needle right in the groove, either straight in or at two angles or in three, whatever you, you know, you, you decide what you, what, how much of a difference you're wanting to make. 
And once again, 20 minutes, and I can take something that is, you know, just too edgy down to something that I haven't killed, but I've made it a little more mellow. It's something you almost don't hear until you play it, and then you say, oh, yeah. Um, and it's hard as, as just a piano technician instead of as a pianist to notice that difference because it's very, it, uh, it's subtle, but it makes all the difference in the world to trying to make the music sound. No question. I'm going to uh, I'm going to cut in here real quick and just uh, mention for the people that are watching on YouTube, Facebook, we're gonna uh, we usually just lock, cut off there about halfway, quarter of the way through. So we'll cut off there. If you do want to continue with this conversation, we've put a link in the chat so that you can um, join us in the Zoom. And go ahead and do that. Um, if if you got some more to say about voicing, uh, I think that that's that would be interesting to hear. Uh, I also was curious uh, if you wanted to chat a little bit about what you what you think you're going to talk about in the class that you're going to do at the upcoming convention. Um, sure. Um, you know, there, there we're talking about something very foundational, keys. Um, and mostly key bushings, um, also balance holes, just dealing with keys in such a way that they are precise. Um, that's the interface of the fingers. We want the, um, we, want, we want to have them be as close to friction free as possible and as close to having no wobble as possible. Right. And so how do you do that? How Careful. do you do that? Nicely, and uh, how how do you how do you take a new piano and get it into that condition? And then we'll talk about how do you take uh, bushings that have become somewhat sloppy and deal with that. And my own method, uh, which is to use steam. I've been using steam since before. VS Pro Felt came around and when, when it came, I tried it out and I decided I didn't need to spend the extra two hours. So um, I'll be showing how to steam size bushings, um, bring them back out or back in, I guess is the word. Um, so that that's essentially the, um, the topic of the class and how to do it efficiently. Excellent. Because, you know, one of, I, I guess, one of the things that we as piano technicians need to do is become very efficient in our work. Otherwise, our work is not affordable. Or high-end work is not affordable unless you can do it efficiently, maximum efficiency. Um, you can, you can make more money per hour and still sell the job cheaper. You know, it's win-win. It's for us and it's for our customers. But if you can't get it within what is reasonably affordable, then you're only going to be able to, to service the high rollers. Well, that's fine for those of you who, who have that kind of clients. I don't have that kind of clients. I live in a, in a fairly impoverished state. Um, and the ones who really care are musicians and musicians don't have any money. So, you know, we're kind of stuck here. We're in this symbiotic relationship. And how can I make your instrument serve your purposes? Uh, in a way that you can afford. And, you know, this is kind of my, my mantra and what I've been working toward over my whole career is to be able to say, I know that I can take your grand piano and give me a day and a half 
and I will transform it from something that you almost can't play into something that is really quite wonderful. How can I do that? Well, I'll do, I'll start with the keys and I'll get, you know, the keys in uh, solid and, and free. And then I'll work up from there and go through the whole um, action prep thing. I'll take care of surfaces like knuckles and uh, capstans and whip and cushions, um, lubricate them, brush them, whatever needs to be done. And then I'll do prep work like what is done, what I like to call focusing the hammer on the string. There are a few elements of that. They're very, everybody knows what they are. Well, we have to start by having good center pinning. It has to be free, it has to be solid. The hammer, the shank needs to be uh, held very well. It needs it, no shivering, no flopping. And then it needs to go straight. You need to do absolutely um, precision travel. And then you need to get the hammer um, squared on that uh, arc toward the string. And then you need the crowns all to be um, square with the sides of the hammer, um, nicely shaped. And you need to level the strings. And once you've done that, you've focused it and you, you get focused sound, you get, uh, you're already 90% mated. So you've done, uh, you know, not, now you've got the, 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 the tonal basis for that piano. And then we go to, uh, to regulation and, you know, we're talking about the main things being close, consistently close um, let off on, on a gram. Um, one to one and a half millimeters is God. Um, drop contact should happen when, when the hammer is about mm, three to four millimeters from the string. Then you go through let off and it comes back down to being two to three millimeters from the string. And, and you do that feeling uh, and then, you know, you're, um, you're looking at, well, check, uh, we'll, we'll need to worry about later to, to, to actually get it. Uh, you know, it, all of these things are cyclical. So there's, right. there's check, which has to happen before you do the, the rep spring and the rep spring needs to be even and fast, but not jerky. And, and so forth. And you get all of these things together and now you can worry about, uh, I think David had mentioned aftertouch at the beginning. Uh, so where are we with aftertouch? Mm. What is aftertouch? Um, I, like, I, I like to try to, partly as a pianist and then working as a technician, it's a matter of what you feel. Um, if you, if you put your five, five fingers on five keys of a grand piano or an upright piano, actually, you go down an eighth of an inch or so, three millimeters, three to four millimeters, and you should feel at that point consistently the dampers. Now you push down your damper pedal and you go all the way down to where you get drop and jack tender contact, which is another more or less three milliliters. Now you go through, um, through that off and there's this, um, this frictional thing that's happening where, where the, um, you know, the jack is going under the knuckle and then there's a drop to the bottom. So it's that drop to the bottom right there that is the aftertouch. 
um, there needs to be enough aftertouch. There can't be too much. Too much slows you down, um, not enough chokes you. So, um, In, in refining aftertouch, um, I push my pedal down and I lower my fingers on the keys to that point of simultaneous or very close to simultaneous uh, jack tender and uh, drop to repetition lever contact. And then I play each one. I, I play through with each one and I feel that bump to the bottom. And, um, and I do, I mean, I might, I might do it with a gauge to start with. I check it with a gauge, uh, you know, 50 thousandths, 40 thousandths um, as, a, as a starting point. But the final one is to feel. Um, Fred. You're being an unbelievably powerful shill for my class at the conference, which is called Secrets of Aftertouch. What you're saying is basically what I'm going to say and show. And yeah, so you don't need to go to his class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. another, another aspect of that, though, is that, you know, first I'll do it slow so it doesn't sound. Then I'll do it fast. And I want each note, each hammer to hit the string and hit it yeah. even. Yeah. So lay off the knuckles is what Eric Shandler. Yep. Said. Yep. If it won't, that, if it that's won't, how I said precise let off by by that method, by that uh oral method of like ghosting the hammer up to the string, you know. Playing off the knuckle, uh, uh, playing off the bump. What, what, uh, that, what that ensures is that the pianist can count on pianissimo on every single note. Bingo. Because if you can count on it on all but one note, and that one note is the one that you need to play that pianissimo in the bass on, and you know, I'm talking experience here. I have a few, yeah. a few pieces where there is that, you know, the very end of the note, and I need pianissimo on C1 or whatever, and I can't do it. <sighs> it, it, it. You know, you destroyed the whole damn piece. I, uh. I guess that this is another another aspect of this is that. You know, we need precision. A piano is a precision um, a machine. And a pianist needs that precision. It's not fuzzy and, uh, you know, artsy craftsy. It's, it's, it's got to be precise. Focused. And it also, um, every single detail has to be there. All, all it takes is one tuning pin that you didn't quite get aligned right along with the tension of the string. And that one unison, you know, we're, you killed it. You know, the whole beast is dead. And, and the same thing with a badly block, a blocking hammer or, you know, it, it's, it has to be damn near perfect, which is why the obsessive compulsive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because you, you don't want to hear, you don't want to hear, you don't want to hear a lone note that goes, blah, 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 you know, blah, blah. Well, what one bad unison shows up everywhere. Uh, my worst nightmare. Hey, Ethan, do we have uh, more questions? I think we do. Yeah, we do. All right, so what do we got here? Interesting question from a little while back. One that's probably pretty quick. 
do you set up grand action una quarter to keep three strings on a hammer or miss? By preference, three strings um, for the reason that, well, for two reasons. Um, for, th for those who use the unicorda pedal as an on-off switch, it does uh, off is fine. For those who either by accident or on purpose use gradations of it, there is always, if it's going to shift off, there is always going to be the point at which the edge of the hammer uh, is touching that third string. And that's not a nice sound. And, uh, and, um, and so you, you have this sudden, you know, it's not a nice gradation. And the other thing is that there are uh, issues of, um, of, of damper um, noise, damper oink, uh, that happen only when you're missing that string. And it's usually right up where it's most noticeable around B4, C5 um, on Steinway Ds. Um, and that's unacceptable. Uh, you know, you're you're playing and you get the or suddenly and you're you've got the oh, unicorn right. down, you're playing softly and oink. So so yeah, that I I, I keep them off. Cool. Uh, next question, Robert Cope. Interesting question, maybe just based on your reflections of uh, of uh, the studies of, of your piano playing and so on. If you don't have an answer, that's fine. He said has there ever been a piano building tradition in either Mexico or Brazil? Has your work ever taken you into those countries to explore instruments? Oh, well, I spent a year in Brazil when I was 12. Um, and I didn't explore any pianos during that year. Um, but there have been there have been an, and there, it's possible there is now, uh, I, I don't know, there have been piano manufacturers in Brazil in particular. Um, not sure of the quality, but yeah, it has happened. In Mexico, I don't think there was, there, was, there were, were at least a few square, square pianos made way back when. Uh, and there is one that is, <laughs> in a museum in, in Arizona. Um, I have been to Mexico. Um, I've performed in Mexico. I, I, uh, you know, one of the things that I, one of the uh, more recent focus I've had is playing music by um, living composers and uh, a couple of living composers, Mexican composers whose music I um, I am playing and it, it's, it's wonderful to have that opportunity to have feedback from, um, from a composer. Um, so I've, I've traveled quite a bit in Mexico, not so much with piano. I mostly look at archeology. span um, I can yeah. say that, uh, I, I don't know what this has to do with Brazil, but on the other side of the country, I mean, on the of the continent in in Peru, I spent some time, and I specifically was curious to explore what kind of pianos they had there, um, and it was interesting just to see what was available. Not much, um, and especially nowadays, um, in the major cities, there were there was pianos, but um, a lot of imports from Germany, a lot more, um, and, and particularly uh, Ronish was probably one of the better brands that I had seen within the bounds of Peru. So I'm guessing there's probably a few in Brazil as well. Um, okay, next question. How much aftertouch is best? 45, 60? And we know you kind of ultimately test it by touch, but any thoughts? Uh, typically 40 is around what I use. Um, occasionally less. Not not any less than 30. Occasionally a wee bit more, 45 is acceptable. 60 is too much. Now why? Um, there are, there are a, a, a few issues here. One is key dip. Key dip is too much 
on modern pianos. Modern piano actions with their five to one and even less than five to one ratios are contrary to human ergonomics. Moving your finger that far is nasty. Um, having played on instruments of earlier days, the instruments Chopin played on were more like seven to one and dip was more like eight millimeters, seven to eight millimeters. And that makes all the difference in the world to being able to play it fluidly. Um, music of Beethoven and, and, and Mozart and Haydn, uh, theirs was more like five to six millimeters and you know, 10 to one to up to 15 to one ratios. So this is not something that is um, common knowledge and, and common experience of pianists, but when, you, when we start to extend to 11 millimeter dip to get enough aftertouch, to get enough key, to, to get enough hammer throw, um, we're getting into the realms of, you know, you got to be an acrobat. You have to be, uh, you know, a weightlifter or, or something. I mean, I can play, I, I, I can do it, but, but I've been working at it for 60 years. Poor kids who were trying to learn to play the piano they, that kind of range of motion and the amount of weight they have to go through is, is too much. And so we, we want to minimize key dip as a starting point. That is, we want to at least keep it down to no more than 10 and a half millimeters. And the way you do that partly is to have a little less aftertouch. But the other thing is, quickness of repetition. Repetition has to do with how far you have to lift the key before you are able to get a, um, a, a, a new strike. And this particularly is important, not just not when you're doing this thing, bang, 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 but when you're playing pianissimo trills or tremolos, of one kind or another. How do you do that successfully? You do it by not raising your fingers more than half of key dip. Um, so how far up does the key have to go before the hammer resets? And aftertouch is lost motion for that point of view. So yeah, you need to have enough so that you feel that bump, but you also need to have, you need to minimize it. Um, this is high end, uh, you know, uh, and, and, if, and, and if you are setting up a brand new piano with new parts, you're better off to have more aftertouch because the parts are going to you're going to get compression, and pretty soon you're not going to have any aftertouch because the the blow distance is going to increase, and that's you know that's bad practice. Um, the pianist is going to complain after playing it on on it for a month or so. This is all great stuff. We appreciate it so much. We're actually running out of time here. Um, and uh, it's just we're just getting warmed up as usual, so that's that's good for a couple of reasons. One, definitely get people excited about seeing you at the convention. Um, I put the link in the for the convention sign up there in the chat again, and there's that coupon code if you want to grab it before it expires. Um, yeah, but it's been really cool to have you you here today, Fred. Uh, really excellent. You had a lot of wonderful insights and. Uh, just kind of letting you letting you talk, you know. You have you have a wonderful uh, way of just kind of uh, explaining something very very well. We don't have any graphics here or anything, and you've done some really wonderful explanations of how you go about things and 
and the way that you think about it all. So it's been very informative. We really appreciate having you here. Fred, I've really learned a lot. Uh, every time, man, you talk, I, I learn so much. Thank you so much. Um, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Advanced piano technology in a focused environment like this. It's beautiful. Thank you for the gift. It was really wonderful. Yes, thanks. Good to be with you. So uh, I'll just say before, you can leave your, uh, leave your browser open a little bit after we sign off so we can get your audio recording. But after it tells you that on Zencaster that it's finished uploading, then, then you can close it. Okay, so just check your Zencaster after we sign off. Okay. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch, you and I, about the convention as we move forward. And we'll say goodbye to everyone out there. Have a nice week, and we'll be back yeah. seven days from now. Pleasure to see you, Fred. Pleasure to see you all. Thank you so much for supporting this. Appreciate yes. it. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Okay. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.